Good evening, everyone. Well, it's wonderful to see so many out tonight, and I hope that you'll open up those Bibles and follow along with us as we're studying together. Uh, I've received permission to go ahead and conduct this as a Bible class, and, and I would like to do just that. And I, I think that there's something really special about us hearing something and then in our minds formulating a response or something. It, about the time that you're able to take a concept and put it in words and express it, it's just so much better for our understanding and for remembering that lesson later on. And so it may sound kind of funny to say, coming from a preacher, but preaching is not actually my favorite thing to do. If you were to ask, uh, in my order of preference, I far prefer sitting at someone's uh, dining table or at their couch and just a couple of people together and a, and a Bible and studying together. If I had my druthers, that's what I would mostly do. Uh, the next order of preference would be Bible classes like this, where we have a, an open discussion and a back and forth. Uh, and so, and again, it sounds kind of strange, but probably third most favorite thing to do is actual preaching. Uh, but tonight we're going to do my second favorite thing, which is to have a group and open Bible study. Here we're talking about lessons learned from the conquest of Canaan, relationship, rupture, and restoration. I, I don't think we probably like the idea of rupture. Uh, we don't like the idea that something could come up in a relationship and be a disruption to that relationship. That doesn't sound pleasant. And yet, that is kind of the nature of relationships. Relationships hit rocky spots. Relationships have ups and they have downs. Uh, how many in here have uh, heard of the person, uh, oftentimes said of maybe an older couple, maybe grandparents or something, I never heard them had a crossword with each other. How many have heard something like that, right? Never heard it. And I would say there's a 90-something percent likelihood is you just simply never heard the crossword because it wasn't in front of you. They had the dignity to take it offline, right? Uh, it wasn't a day and age in which it was put out on social media. Took the disagreements offline, had the discussion, went through whatever rupture it was, worked it out, and then went back to work together. That is the nature of even very healthy relationships. It's simply the way of relationship. Now, to believe that there will never, ever be a disagreement among us, that is just unlikely. It's not going to happen. That conflict will never, ever come along. No, it most certainly will. There has literally only ever been one perfect person to walk on the face of the earth. And what that tells us is, there's going to be rupture and difficulty and conflict in relationships. That's just how it's going to be. Okay. So with that, let's go over to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. I think something kind of uh, funny here. If there was not the potentiality for any kind of disruption within relationships, I'm going to suggest to you that our Bibles would probably be a lot thinner than what they are. Because we have instructions to husbands and wives and to children. We know how to deal with our neighbors and with employers and with employees. The Bible, the New Testament is full of that sort of thing. So how about here in James chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. But no one can tame the tongue as a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and curses, my brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Amen to that, right? It shouldn't be that way, but it is. So, All right, so let's kind of take that as a background. What we know from experience and even the New Testament about relationship, rupture, and restoration and let's go back into our Old Testament now, into the book of Joshua. Surprise, surprise, the 24th chapter. And I think it would benefit us by doing a little bit of reading right here. And let's just, let's say take two verses each. And we're going to read from verses 14 
down through verse 28. And uh, maybe, can we just start on this side and sort of work our way back, and then we'll work our way through two verses each, and let's just start over here. Joshua 24, beginning verse 14. If you don't want to read, that's fine, we'll... Strong statements, aren't there? Okay. Well, let's keep reading. Two more verses. Who else? Who's our next reader over here? Twenty and twenty one, who's our next reader? Next two. ones. All right, let's finish it off then. Who wants to do that? And this is just, this is a fun aside, but here he says, the stones will be a witness, right? These stones will be a witness. They, they, they essentially speak. Remember when Jesus was, uh, they, they confronted him. Why, why are these people giving you praise? Why are they giving you adora adoration? Why are they? And he says, if they don't, remember what happens? These stones <laughs> would be doing it. Just an interesting connection between these. All right, so let's kind of uh, set, set our stage here. This is part of Joshua's final address to the people. And uh, let's see. And through the, through the last several chapters, chapters uh, 22 through 24, uh, we are having a change. Up through chapter 21, we are working on getting into the land and then taking the land. In chapters 22 through 24, then, we are switching subjects so that Israel is being preserved in the land. How, is, how are they going to be preserved in the land? And chapter 22, it's going to be by observing the law of the Lord. And so chapter 23, then, Joshua exhorts the people to live faithfully to this law. And now, here in chapter 24, he's going to say, choose for your today, yourselves today whom you're going to serve. So, is it a good thing to get into the land? Obviously. But we want to be preserved in the land. 
Remind me of this one. Do you remember from the top of your head, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13? Be not weary in well-doing. Don't grow, don't grow weary in it. I'm glad that you got in. I'm glad that you've taken the land. Don't get weary in it. And we can sometimes in the Lord's service. Unfortunately, we can get weary. We can get worn out. And we need to build each other up and keep each other going. Chapter 24 is so very interesting because these people are called to account to choose for themselves today. I thought this choice had already been made. Who made the choice originally? Was it these people? It was made much earlier. It was actually made by a prior generation. Because that was a generation that came up and out of Egypt. What happened to that generation? They did. They all died off in the wilderness. These are now the children. This is next gen. And next generation has to choose for themselves who they will serve. It's a wonderful thing for grandparents to have chosen. It's a wonderful thing for parents to choose. Does there come a time in which children have to choose for themselves? Oh, they do, don't they? There comes that time, and it is that time for them to choose themselves. All right, here in verse 1, we didn't read verse 1, but we can see it very easily that Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and their judges and their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua orders the tribes to convene at Shechem, and he's going to do a couple things. Number one, there's going to be a public reading of the covenant's terms, because if they're going to have to choose for themselves, they need to know what they're agreeing to. Would it be best before you sign a contract to read the contract or know what's in it? Oh, yes. And so they're going to read through it. They're going to know what's in it. And then they're going to get a chance to choose to either do it or not do it for themselves. So that's one thing here. And, the, and, then, and this renewal of that for themselves. So... There's a sense here which we do each first day of the week. Do we regularly assemble to a place when we're called? We do. Is there anything about partaking of the Lord's Supper that sort of brings back to memory the elements of the covenant that we are under with our God? Do we need to examine ourselves and choose again for this upcoming week that I'm going to do it. Or maybe I need to pick it up a little bit. I need to put some things away and put some things on. It's true. As much as what he called them and put it in front of them, we are called to come here and it's put in front of us again. Here was the price of your salvation. Are you going to live in a worthy manner of that? And we choose for ourselves again. Well, they not to do it. Let's look at verse 2. In verse 2, he's going to rehearse for them God's faithful election of Israel. Someone remind me of this. Did we first love God? He first loved us, didn't he? Yeah. Did we first choose him? No. No, no, no. We were chosen, the plan, not the man, but this was chosen before the foundations of the world, before there were people to choose. This plan was already chosen. If you'd like some scriptural reference, that's 1 John 4, verse 10. Not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us. And then Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. He chose us before the foundation of the world. And then there's an amazing section. From the second part of verse 2 all the way down through verse 13. And what he does for them is he reviews. 
He reviews for them the Lord's dealings with them from Abraham all the way down to the conquest itself. And let's just give the Cliff's Note version of this. How well had God treated them through those various years? Had he blessed them? He did. Had he shown them grace? Has he shown them mercy? Has he given them protection? You know, we get the information about Balaam and Balak. Remember the prophet, the, the mercenary prophet for hire, Balaam and Balak. And they go from one high place to another planet to another high place. In anywhere in there, do you ever read that Israel actually knew that that was going on at the moment that it was going on? Were they aware that someone was actually trying to destroy them up on the nearest mountain overlooking them? I don't think we ever see it. They learned it later. God was giving them protection when they didn't even know they were getting protection. God had treated them so very well. What is the probability, if we were to look militarily speaking, what is the probability that we take a bunch of people who have been slaves for an extended period of time, and they're going to go marching into a land, place where people are trained as soldiers. What was said of Goliath? How long had he been a soldier? They laughed at David because he wasn't. What was David? He's a shepherd. He says, you're a youth. And you're really planning on going up against a Goliath who's, who's been, what? A warrior since his youth. The idea that this bunch of former slaves were going to come up into this land and take it from these people, militarily speaking, that was laughable. It really was. It was a joke. No way should that have ever happened. The story of them leaving Egypt and, come and coming and conquering that land is such an unlikely story, an improbable story, an impossible story, that if it were not for God's grace, mercy, love, and faithfulness, it would have never happened. Never happened. That gets reviewed right here in this section of Scripture. Does anyone have a guess? Do you happen to know about how long before this promise had been made to Abraham? They now have the land. They're actually there. Something was promised to Abraham, and now they're actually there. Any guesses? You know it has to be longer than how long they stayed in Egypt, and that was about... It was. Probably pushing closer to 800 total since the time of Abraham to the time that they're actually in the land. Because again, 500 of us, or 400 of us spent in down in Egypt, right? And now we've got another 40 years here, and then we've got seven years of, of wars around that off, and just in lifetimes, it's been a long time. But when God makes a promise, can he keep it even though hundreds of years have gone by? Easily. I can't make you a promise of something that's hundreds of years in advance saying I'm going to do it because I'm not going to be here to do it. But our God is the same, has been, is, and ever will be. And so, our God is the God who acts in history to bring about his promises. Gene, I, uh, I know that you, you like some movies, right? Do you enjoy movie watching and everything? Okay. Have you watched enough movies that you can start to pick up on the plot and have kind of an idea of where the whole thing's headed? Right. And, and, when, and when that doesn't go that way, when they sort of flip the script to do something totally different, we call it a plot twist, right? Sure. And so these movie makers, they, they keep us on our toes sometimes with this. I want to give you a mental picture of how our God is able to do things. Well, Gene will sit down and he'll watch a movie frame by frame. 
And that's how we watch things, essentially, frame by frame by frame. It's as if our God can stand back and see the entire movie from begin to end. And it's not just that he sees it, but he can be in every single frame of the entire distance of the thing. The best you and I can do is live it frame by frame and kind of understand what's come before, kind of have an idea of maybe what's coming. But we serve a God who sees the entire movie end to end and is in every single scene, the whole distance. And our God works in history to bring his promises about. No matter the difficulty, the challenges, or the generations of times that it takes, he can and does do it. That is something that's being rehearsed in these several verses right here. And lastly, I think there's great benefit in recounting the wondrous deeds of the Lord. I hope that in your own families that you're very comfortable recounting the wonderful things that the Lord has done for you. If you have had sins or things of the past that you have escaped from by His grace and mercy, then I hope that you're willing to put those out in front of your kids. If there's greater contentment and satisfaction and peace in your life today than there was five years ago, please recount those wonderful deeds in your family. They need to hear it too. There's a wonderful benefit in recounting the wonders and the wondrous deeds of the Lord. Because his faithfulness to his promises in the past give us confidence in his faithfulness to the promises that are yet to come. You see, all that he has done gives us confidence for the things that he says are yet to come. And it should have emboldened these folks as well. All right. Thoughts, comments, or questions about any of that so far? Is all that tracking and making sense to you what, what he is doing? He is making the point that God has been really, really, really good to them. And brethren, if somebody has been really, really, really good to you, what is the only right thing for you to do in return to them? It is. That's, that is the only proper thing, isn't it? And anything less than that is just scandalous to think. That someone could be nothing but absolutely, genuinely good for you over a long period of time. And the first chance you get, you sell them out or turn your back on them or deny that you know them. Ouch, right? None of us would think that that is proper. So do you see what Joshua is doing here and how he's setting them up for? He's been nothing but good, 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 and good to you. Now we get to 14 and 15. God's gracious dealings provides then the basis of the challenge that he lays in front of them, and that is that they should serve the Lord and the Lord only. Right. There isn't any God that has been good to them, that's cared for them, that has carried them, that has blessed them. It's been him and him alone. And so all of these fake, funny, dud things out here that they're all worshiping, stay away from them. They've ne you've never known them. <laughs> They've never done a thing for you. It's been me the whole time. So you go into this land, you drive out those people, you tear down those altars, you don't play with these people. You serve me and serve me only. Well, verses 16 through 18... How do the people answer? What's their answer? Anybody? We'll do it, right? Again, because it's, you're just hard-pressed. When God has been nothing but good and generous and kind and loving and gracious and merciful. I mean, for 40 years. I mean, let's just take the last 40 years, right? For 40 years. Who provided breakfast for them? God did. 
Who provided dinner for him? What did they do for shoes? They never wore out. I'm hard-pressed to get two years out of a good pair of shoes. Forty years of walking in a desert, a wilderness area, and never wore out. Their God was amazing. They went up against armies, and at best, they're shepherds and farmers. And they went up against armies and won. Sihon, Og, others. It shouldn't have been. But it was. Because how gracious God was for them. It was only right for them to answer this way. Far be it from us, they said, that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt. They're getting it, aren't they? They're getting it. From the house of bondage, we used to be slaves. Now we've got our own land. We didn't plant these vineyards. We didn't build these houses. We didn't fortify these cities. God gave us all of this. Far be it from us to do anything other than to serve him. Who did these great signs in our midst and preserved us through, uh, through all the way in which we went and among all the peoples through whose midst we passed? Wow. Yeah, the Lord drove them out. They get this. This is great. I want to take you back to verse 15 because it's important that we set up shop here for just a minute. In verse 15, uh, I, gave you, I gave you a term uh, a couple nights ago that is a Hebrew term that means irrevocable, harem, H-E-R-E-M. I may not be pronouncing it correct. But it means irrevocably dedicated to, and you've got to look for the, the, uh, the context, either to destruction or to the Lord, but either which way, it's irrevocably so. Joshua makes an irrevocable statement for him. Now you all choose, but as for me, let's finish it with me, and my house, we will serve the Lord. Are there occasions in life where you have to walk alone? <laughs> the Lord's with you, but otherwise, human-wise, you might have to walk alone. Kids in school, there's times you might have to walk alone, right? To be what the Lord wants you to be, you may have to walk alone. In your factory, at your family reunions, <laughs> you might have to stand and walk alone. And when that time comes, just know you've irrevocably, there's no going back on this. There's no wiggle room in what Joshua just said right here. It's an irrevocable statement. We will serve the Lord. Now, he gives them an option, though. Did you see that in the first part of 15? What options does he give them? Choose for yourselves today. What's it say? Whom you will serve. Know this. We all serve somebody. We all worship someone or something. We're built to worship, and you're going to worship it. You might worship money. You might worship fame. You might worship... Who knows what it is? You're going to worship something. What we've chosen to do is to worship the Lord. And that answers everything else for us. But he gives them two options. And what are the two options that he lists here? Yes. Okay. The gods that your fathers served. Let's think about this for a second. This is generation two. Generation one, it seemed like every time they turned around, what were they wanting to do? They wanted to go back. So, Gene, now that you and your family are in the land, you've seen it, you've experienced it, you know that it's exactly what God said it was. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's beautiful. It's perfect. It's gorgeous. Exactly the way he said it was. Gene, after all of that and all of what God has done for this nation, if you just really, truly still want to go back to Egypt, then what? Get going, right? It's that way. It's a long ways. <laughs> it's going to take you a while, but get going. All right. What was the other option? Okay. 
Okay. So if you would like to choose the gods that these people had and incurred my wrath and the destruction that was just put upon them, if you want to join in with them and have my wrath rendered against you, then here's your opportunity. It's kind of sad to think of it in, this, in these terms. But it's as if God, through Joshua, is saying to them, if I haven't been good enough to you, if this looks like a bad deal, that I've just cut you short and this looks, just looks terribly one-sided and you're looking at it and say, I don't think this is a good deal for us. If that's your conclusion, I'm giving you an opportunity to get out. That's right. To get out of the covenant. It was your parents that said yes, not you, but here's your time. Here's your chance. Here's your opportunity. What does it sound like today, though? Let's... Because that's them, and we get it for them now. But let's, let's bring it up to today. The God that your father served, how would we ever say something similar to that to a person today? Do people ever get hung up on history and tradition today? Absolutely. Do people ever get hung up on, this is what grandma and grandpa did? That definitely happens, doesn't it? And I can't do that because I'd be condemning grandma and grandpa. I've literally heard these words before, and I, I'll just quote them to you. Grandpa was the most religious person I ever knew. He didn't do this, and he's dead. I am not condemning grandpa. Well, we know from the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man died. And being, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes, and when he realized that there was nothing to do about his situation, you know what his thoughts turned to? That were still here, that still had an opportunity to do something different. And if he could send a message back, don't keep doing what you're doing just because of me. You learn the truth, do the truth, don't keep into something's wrong just because I didn't do it. So, I think... The God that your father served beyond the river? Okay, that sounds an awful lot like that. We do run into that. So what about this, what about this other then? What about the gods of the lands that you're, that you're now in? Do we ever run into folks who are just addicted to the new and to the fascinating and to the, to the shiniest, newest thing that comes along, to the modern version of this or that? I think we do. It's every wind of doctrine, every, every new fad that comes through the religious circles. Why can't we be like everybody else? Every other church we only go by, it's fine. they got a playground outside. Why can't we have a playground? And all the other things that go along with it. And he says, if this is what you want, here's your chance. Go. Go do it. But if you want these blessings and the mercies and the graces and all the goodness that I have shown to you over all these years, then you need to stay with me and you need to agree for yourselves to this covenant. I find this interesting. That God was willing to challenge relationship. We're not always wanting to challenge relationship because I think sometimes we're afraid of what the answer might be. You give a person a chance to go, and they just might go. And we don't want to lose people, right? But do you see how he is willing to challenge relationship right here? That if your righteousness, if your dedication, if your commitment does not rise to this level, you and I can't have a relationship anyway. Jesus actually once did this. Do you remember when Jesus did this with some of his disciples? Do you remember what the occasion was? Well, that's true. That is true. So you're, out, you're off in Revelation 3 there in the Laodiceans, right? You're not hot, you're not cold, so therefore I'm going to spew you out. Jesus in the flesh put it to his disciples. Remember when the teaching got really tough? And what did some of the disciples start to do? Started to leave. They said, "Who can? this is difficult. Who can listen to it? And Jesus actually turns to his 
inner circle. And what's he say? Yeah. It is John 6. Yes. And Peter makes a statement, a very strong statement in response to that. Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of life. Right? There's nowhere else to go. If they wanted life, if they wanted the blessings, if they wanted the smile and the favor of God upon them, they needed to respond to this covenant by confirming it for themselves. And they do. They actually do. And they don't just do it once, but they actually technically do it three times. And what I find very interesting is that Joshua almost tries to talk them out of it. In verses 19 and 20, what does he tell them about their agreement when they say that they will. He says, it's going to be hard on you, right? You will not be able to serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done good to you. And after trying to talk them out of it in verse 21, they say, no, no. <laughs> We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Even though there's absolute certain judgment that will come upon them for denying the Lord. There we go. Needed that. That went on there. Now, I think there's some points that need to be brought out about this. For your notes, if you'd write in Deuteronomy chapter 31, 14 through 21, for time's sake, we're not going to read it. But this was actually revealed to Moses, even before the appointing of Joshua as a leader of the people, that these people would depart. That it was going to happen. Moses knew that. In fact, Moses had a song. Do you remember the song of Moses? And in the song of Moses... It's actually in there about what was going to happen, about their future unfaithfulness and the road back. And it said that the people, that he would put it in their minds because that song would be a witness to them when the time came. There's a whole other side of that I'd love to discuss with you sometime, but we're not going to right now. God knew beforehand that they would not keep the covenant, but God was still willing to do what? Enter into the covenant with them. Knowing that they would break it, he still entered into it with them anyway. What's that say about your God? That he is willing to enter a covenant even knowing the people he was going to get into it with were going to break it. What's it say about his graciousness? Kindness? Mercy? Love? I mean, in all seriousness, did, would you want to sign a contract with somebody if they've told you even before signing it, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to take everything that you're supposed to do, hold you to it, but I am not going to uphold my end of this contract. Do you really want to sign that contract with somebody? You're going to, you're going to advance me 10 grand, and Jim, I'm not going to show up and do the work. Do you still advance the 10 grand? Be hard pressed. But our God put all the blessings there knowing exactly how they were going. God takes us knowing full well that we will rupture the relationship because of sin. But he takes us anyway. What an incredible God we have. And what a story it tells about his grace, his mercy, his love, his long suffering. It's absolutely incredible. I want to give you a scripture here. Probably again, for time's sake, we'll let you read it on your own. But Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 31. Does our God want us to fail? No. This, that particular uh, case right there is with Peter. And it is before, it's at the end of the Lord's, uh, the establishment of the Lord's Supper and, and heading out to Gethsemane. 
and the Garden of. And they're discussing a variety of things. Actually, it's kind of sad. They're discussing who was, uh, who was first and most preeminent and all this kind of thing. And he's telling them it's, it's not that way among you. Peter said, look, even if I have to go to jail or die, I will. Everyone else said the same thing. He says before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. And he tells Peter, he says, I've prayed for you that his faith, what's the rest of it? May not fail. But once you have turned again, repented, is that fair? Once you've repented, I've prayed for you that you not fail. But once you've repented, what, what's indicated there? Peter was going to fail. And Jesus is still being ultra kind to him here. Still being generous to him. But once you have turned again, what was he to do? Strengthen your brethren. It never occurred to you about the whole Peter striking the high priest's slave's head and cutting off his ear? It never occurred to you about Jesus healing that man's ear? Was that, was that all that was at play right there? What's that? It was symbolic, for sure. Do you suppose there would have been any legal ramifications for having attacked another person with a sword? They still had laws, you know. Do you suppose there's anything special about if you attack the high priest slave that is actually as if it was an attack upon the high priest himself? Could Peter have been set up for a capital crime punishment-wise? He could have. But by the fact that Jesus healed the man's ear, what happened? There was no case because there was no injury. Jesus saved Peter's life. What's that? Put it up, right. Put it up, yeah. He saved his life before he saved his soul. Just a thought. Our Lord is defending and protecting us right, left, and up, and down in every which way in ways that we haven't even considered or imagined that he is there defending and protecting us. But he did there too. All right. So, he didn't want his faith to fail, but once, uh, but once he had turned again, strengthen his brethren. In 1 first, uh, first John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, uh, this one we do need to read. Let's go over to 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Uh, a reader, whoever gets there first. Right? How many have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? All, right? Romans 3, 23. All of us have. Here he says, I write to you that you may not sin. It's kind of what Jesus said to Peter. I prayed for you that your faith not fail. Very similar. So, I'm writing that you, that, uh, that you may not sin. And if anyone sins... <laughs> What's he saying? It's going to happen, isn't it? It's going to happen. And if anyone sins, what do we have? An advocate with the Father. An advocate with the Father to turn away wrath from us. Turn away judgment and punishment. A propitiation for our sins. We have a God that has taken us into his family, allowing us to wear his name, to have the hope of his home eternal in his kingdom now and the hope of his home eternal, knowing full well that we are going to need to exercise that clause right there. And if anyone sins, we have an adequate. He knows that and he's taken us anyway. 
we have a gracious. Oh, in chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's the first point. The second point I want to make to you about it uh, is this right here. They accepted the covenant knowing that failure was in the future, but restoration was available to them with repentance. And this is what you and I know as well. He accepts us even knowing that we will have failing experiences. Not that we want to, not that we should, but he takes us anyway. When we come in, we need to understand, not that we want to, and we're trying not to, because we want to honor him and glorify him, but we're going to have failing experiences, and he has sinned, and he's going to, and he's made a way for us to be restored to him. Why am I telling you this? We need to know it, because the devil delights in discouragement. The devil delights in making me feel like I am a phony and a failure, and that I'll never get it right. And why would he take someone like me when I seem to be, he said 70 times 7, I am pretty sure I am on my 470th time. At 471, am I just done? I mean, I would be done with me. Is he done with me? And the answer is no. No indeed. Judas, discouraged and distraught, to the point of hanging himself. Peter, another one of those 12, he was distraught, but he repented. Now here's a fun little thing. How many times did Peter deny the Lord? Three times. And when Jesus meets and has a little breakfast with them there, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And the answer was, yes. And then he asked him, what question? Do you love me? And then he asked him, do you love me? Peter denied him three times, and then what did Peter get a chance to do? Confess his love three times. Isn't that fun? What fun symmetry between those things. To see that he got to equally undo what he had done prior to that. It's not a matter of whether or not rupture comes in relationship between husbands and wives, between children and parents, between brothers and sisters, between, between members of the Lord's body, between us and the Lord. It's not a matter if rupture will come to a relationship. It's not a really a matter of when, but, but if, or if, uh, if, but uh, when there it comes. The primary concern is actually this. How do we get to restoration? How do we get to restoration? That's really the primary concern. And that was mapped out for them. They knew what to do. Even Solomon at the dedication of this temple talked about, if because you haven't been honoring the Lord, you're taken off into captivity somewhere, but if they'll pray towards this place, hear them, O Lord, and bring them back. The formula for restoration is put in place at the very time of the taking and the accepting of the relationship. We have an incredible God. So, the primary concern is how do we get to restoration and how quickly do we get to restoration? What would you estimate with Peter? Did, it, did we get the restoration pretty quickly with Peter? Did Peter pretty quickly regret, repent, sorrowful? Yes. Yeah, he did. Uh, by comparison, where would you rank the prodigal son? Was that a quick turnaround for the prodigal? Uh, it doesn't feel like it, does it? He went to the far country and he lived it up for a while. And, and then what happened in the land? There's a famine in the land. That's not an overnight thing. That takes a while. And, and then he's really impoverished. And then he's out with the pigs. And then it's thinking about pig food. And, and then finally he makes a decision, right? So that wasn't a quick turnaround. It doesn't feel like anyway for the prodigal. He found it. But it wasn't quick. Our real concern when there's rupture 
is how do we get to restoration and how quickly can we get there? He knows that we will struggle at times and he accepts us anyway to allow us to come to him anyway. He gives a, a greater grace. He gives a grace that is sufficient for whatever we've got ourselves into. And I don't want to click that button. Here we go. Oh, yikes. Gene, I've really wrecked it here. Oh, I know. I, I'm ex as exasperated as you are right now. Just a second here. All right. Look at us just clicking right along. Feels like this was a half hour ago. And... and <laughs> There. All right. Let's leave it right there. We need to know that we, at times, will have failing sin experiences. And we need to serve and come to service to him anyway. We need to repent when it is needed and get back to our work, to our service this is what the conquest of Canaan teaches us about relationship, about rupture, and about, about restoration. And because of God's grace and kindness towards us, what we come to know is, I can live in this land. What he has called me into, into his church and into his salvation, because of who he is, I can live here. I can thrive here. I can glorify him here despite weaknesses. Despite my propensity to step to the right or to the left. He's given me a path even in the welcoming to the relationship to restore the relationship. And once again, all I can say is, we have an amazing God to serve. The lesson is yours this evening. I hope something in there has been useful to you. Uh, people need to know that they can belong. They, know, they need to know that they can actually exist here and live here and thrive here. You're a person with problems? <laughs> so am I. Welcome to the club, right? I'll help with yours. You help with mine. We'll strengthen each other. And we will march arm in arm up to those gates to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. I find that exciting. <laughs> I find that energizing. It's hard for me to get excited about something if I know I'm going to work really, really hard and it can only end in failure. <laughs> That's hard for me to get up for. <laughs> but if I know that despite weaknesses and troubles and issues, I can find success. That I can be one that still glorifies God. I can work. I can be. I can belong. I can welcome others into it. We can do this and do it together. This evening, if it is that you're here and you've not come into this, I encourage you to do so. If you've heard and believe what you've heard, why not act upon it? Repent of sinful things. Confess your belief in him and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you've done that, but, what you've, uh, but you've uh, engaged in sinful things, if it's of a private nature, go to God in prayer, ask for forgiveness of that. If it's of a public nature, publicly confess it, and we'll pray with you and for you for the forgiveness of it. And then we're going to hook you by the arm, and we're going to walk with you through that difficult patch, get you back to full strength, and go back to work. Restoration, that's what we're about. And if this evening you simply need the prayers of the congregation, for strength, for encouragement, whatever you need might be. Won't you make a note, but come forward as we stand and sing.